Okay, well, um, good morning, everybody, and um, welcome to the uh, first British Heart Foundation Zoom session in the preparation for the 2024 London Marathon. Um, you're now, if you haven't realised already, at the start of a very exciting journey um, for quite a wonderful challenge. And, uh, and quite a wonderful charity. And a very wonderful charity. And I don't think I've ever met anybody who's done the London Marathon who has not felt it's been a just an amazing day um perhaps some of you've done it before but it is it is probably one of the one of the best marathons in the world with the best crowd the best atmosphere and it is just it's quite amazing so um but also the journey is amazing the journey will you will discover things about yourself you didn't know that's for sure but um we've got a great lineup for today um and we'll, I'll introduce them as we go along but um I just want to stress that, and this is not kind of blowing our trumpets, but the advice you're going to get today um, is from real people with years of real experience. Um, it's not just kind of internet soundbite stuff. This is kind of real knowledge, real experience. And if you listen to this, it will help you uh, prepare properly it'll help you avoid injury it'll help you um, stay consistent in your training and it will save you a lot of pain come race day so I encourage you to try to put as much of this into practice as you possibly can so without further ado we're gonna um, pass across to the force of nature that's known as Jazz from British Heart Foundation and she's going to give you some top tips for your fundraising. Okay, we're just going to stop this share and off over to you, Jazz, to, to share your Yeah, screen. Great. Well, hi, everyone. And thank you so much for joining. You, Some of you may know my name because I've spoken to so many of you when we were kind of onboarding everybody and going through the applications and just doing those initial calls. So... It'd be nice to see some of your faces now for the first time and kind of meet you virtually. Um, I'm just going to go into a bit of a fundraising update and like more about what we, the BHF, do as well. So I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully I do this correctly. Um, right, here we go. The real test is sharing screens. Sorry, Keith and Debbie, I will be too. Right. Don't worry. <clears throat> if not, we can right. put it up and you can talk. I, you should be able to see, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah, we can see that, Jazz, that's perfect. That work? And can you see go my presentation? The, yeah, go to your little slide, that's the one. Lovely. Too, too long. Next one. Is it not this? Right. All right. Okay. Perfect. I usually am more technolo technological advanced, but it, it sometimes just lags. But anyway, it's nice to meet everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Really appreciate it. And we just thought it'd be nice for you to meet our team. So there are usually more of us, but unfortunately, my colleague is off sick, but his name's Andy. And we do have somebody new that's joined our team and her name is Lauren. So you'll have a lot of support from myself, Andy and Lauren on this journey. And I'll just go into a bit about what we do and just some of those kind of top fundraising tips that we can give to you as well, because we appreciate it can be quite a daunting experience. And not only do you have to worry about kind of getting your training done, but also the fundraising. So we obviously want to make it as easy as possible and you get that kind of support and know that it's accessible to you as well. Yeah, so. just before you crack on, I think if you go along to your presentation, you'll see that that next one on the on the right. Yes, press that one. Yeah. That's Perfect. One. Okay, great. Thank you, Debs. Um, right, so just kind of a bit about what we do. So as the BHF, we raise money to research cures and treatment so we can give more people times with the ones that they love, heart attacks, strokes, newborn babies with broken hearts. These are just some of the cruelties of cardiovascular disease. And the brutal, brutal reality is there are so much more to science uh, to discover before we can beat the world's biggest killers. And I know that I, like reading your applications and speaking to a lot of you, that you do have a real deep 
personal connection to the cause. So thank you so much for choosing us, choosing the BHF to support. We really appreciate it. And I think when it comes to fundraising as well, it's so important for you to know where your money is going. And it's important that you understand that we are currently funding over 900 research projects as well. Um, so Cure Heart is a current project that we're funding, and this is for inherited heart muscle diseases. Around 30 million people across the world have a deadly inherited heart muscle de defect. Now, thanks to the BHF, the biggest ever research grant, a team of world expert experts are aiming to deliver a cure. So that's just a little bit of insight. There's so much more information on our website, and there's a lot more information that we'll be sharing around with you as well. Um, and just a little timeline of our achievements as well. Again, we will be sharing this around with you, but again, in 2019, BHF researchers show that diagnosis of heart rhythm problems can be efficiently done with a smartphone, obviously pacemakers. There's kind of a lot here to look into in terms of what the BHF have done from as early as 1961 to as late as 2023. So there's, again, a lot of information that you can share. And the reason that I am sharing this with you is because for you to tell your loved ones, to tell your friends, to tell your families why they should support you and why you want them to support you, I think it's really important that they also know what we do and just kind of making that really clear to them as well um, as sharing your own personal connections to the cause. Um, why your fundraising matters. So we fund over a hundred million pounds of research each year into all heart and circulatory diseases and the things that cause them. And this is just a bit of an a explanation as well. It's so much easier for you to explain to your loved ones. Like 50 pounds can help researchers measure tiny levels of chemicals found in heart disease or blood samples. 125 pounds could help to buy a DNA extraction kit. So just kind of things like that and just putting those putting that fundraising into more of a visual for them as well. And even just for you as well, it's important for us to tell you where your money is going because it's really important. Um, online fundraising. So we're more than happy for you to use either platforms. If you need any support with setting these up, we're here. Um, so just please reach out. Um, usually when you sign up, you do automatically get a link to kind of go on that journey with us to get your fundraising set up um, but yeah if you haven't already set your fundraising page up it's, it's always good to kind of get that rolling earlier on especially with Christmas coming up and we're going into the new year so just making people aware aware that you're doing this incredible thing and you're doing it for the BHF so um, just kind of getting those pages set up as early as you possibly can um, and just optimizing your pages as well. So for example, fundraisers with pictures on their page raise 14% more per photo. You could raise 111% more and have supporters keep track of your pro progress when you connect to Strava. Um, and we do have a Strava group set up at the moment, a Team BHF one. So it, it's quite nice for you to see each other's progress as well if you want to join that. And there's um, a few links to it on our social pages and we can obviously send those around to you in an email as well the week coming so just to get you on there and I think it's always good it's quite inspiring and encouraging when you see your fellow like team BHF putting their progress in like what they've done this week and then you can kind of look at it and you'll find that there's always people at the same level as you as well so you don't need to be like comparing yourself to everyone because everyone's in a very similar boat they're just at different distances or they've got different targets so just setting yourself an individual target but then looking in on like what everybody else is doing as well um one really important thing um when it comes to your pages is your story i think it's really important that you share if you feel comfortable enough to share but just a bit about what you're doing and why you're doing it just so that it really tells people like oh you know they're, they really want to do this and they're doing it for a special reason and we really want to support them. Um, and then it just helps your loved ones just see that kind of commitment and that dedication and your reason why um, and why you've joined our team. Um, I've just put a few little ideas here on like what you could be doing in terms of offline fundraising. Um, so we've got, you know, sweepstakes available online that you could download. You could do a raffle, you could get a bit more competitive and, and do like a tournament as well. 
Um, we found actually last year when we were doing the London Marathon that offline fundraising was really, really kind of back in full swing. Um, we had COVID happen, unfortunately, with um, and when it came to like fundraising, especially even post COVID, just getting back out there and doing these more like physical fundraising activities is really, really helpful. So even if you're thinking, oh, well, nobody's going to turn up or like nobody's going to, I'm just really spreading the word and just setting something up. Even like a cake bake at work, going red at work or going red at school. Um, there's so many different avenues that you probably may not have even tapped into yet or even thought about, but um, they're there. And as long as you've kind of got that confidence and got that mindset of like, actually, I'm going to do this. I think, yeah, these are some really kind of good ideas and we will again I will be sharing this around with everybody but just thought it'd be nice for you to see that offline fundraising does work and it doesn't all need to be like just giving or enthuse or whichever platform that you're using just go out and just take a chance really and get your like get people together do a coffee morning do, yeah just get out, out there and kind of do something a bit more different and you'll see that so many people are enjoying it and I think from that their perspective as well they're actually getting something as well like you're putting something on for them and, and then they're more likely to kind of donate to you or, or support you as well so yeah um again just thought it'd be nice for me to remind you of like what kind of contacts that you could be going through you could go, go through work if you've got children you could go through school fundraising sports days non-uniform days and um, sport groups as well if you're part of a running club um, and then obviously family. So just getting your parents and siblings workplaces involved. Again, that's important because you don't necessarily always have to share your fundraising pages with people you directly know. If you've got some really close loved ones, it's always worth asking them to share your page on, on, like, on your behalf. And I'm sure they, they wouldn't object to that and just really getting your story out there. And um, yeah, so it's always really good to do that. Um, and then here's just a bit of information at the end. So I've actually had a few queries about fundraising packs. So just want to make it very clear that we do have fundraising packs and you can get them virtually, you can get a physical, but they are on our website. Again, I'll share this around this week, but there is support there. So we've got our own kind of dedicated London Marathon support team. You'll find the email there. It's londonmarathon at bhf.org.uk and they can kind of post out things like collection tins, balloons, banners, things like that to just really help spread awareness of what you're doing, especially if you're doing one of those offline fundraising activities that I mentioned in the previous slide. But it's always good to have the branding there to really just show everyone what you're doing and just make things look really, like really nice and get the pictures as well to share on your Just Giving pages or on your Facebook pages to, again, just spread the word about what you're doing. Um, there is also two QR links there. There's one to our Just Giving page. If you haven't already set up your page, it's there. So you could use that if you want to set that up. And then there's also the Team BHF on Facebook, which I love. It's a, such a lovely community. And I know that a lot of you are already in that group, but it's really great for us to see as well, like our 2022 team, 2023 team, like always posting and like trying to encourage everybody that's kind of joining us now and going to be do the, doing the London Marathon and you'll find that it'll get busier and busier and it's a really kind of a, we wanted to make it an open space for you to feel confident and open enough to kind of share with your like fellow team BHF what you're doing where you're at what you could potentially be struggling with and again you're not in like you're all in the same boat so um, never be afraid to be honest in the group and say you're struggling with this or could you help with this because as much as we're there for you, they are also there for you as well. Like you're all there for each other. So we we created that group to just have a really nice community of obviously all of our wonderful supporters coming together and um, doing this incredible challenge. So yeah, there's a lot of information there. Um, and if you're interested, if your family and friends are interested in volunteering on the day, let us know. If you want to share your story, more importantly, let us know. Um, again, yeah, we, we are here for you and just wanted to make it very clear that you're not on, in this alone and we will be there for you. There's never a stupid question or a silly question or just never struggle in silence. Always be very open. Let us know what you need and we'll try and get it to you. Um, but yeah, that is everything from me.
um, I'm going to stop sharing now. Fantastic, Jazz. That's absolutely brilliant, and it's really, really helpful. Thank you, Jazz. Thank you. Um, you may now realise that the theme is going to be the top five tips. Um, so we're going to look at the top five tips of training, injury prevention, and nutrition. Um, um, the injury prevention is going to be with Moss shortly, and uh, nutrition is going to be with Tracy. Um, Debbie here, who works with me, <clears throat> excuse me, looking after all the training plans, etc. Most of you had emails from Debbie. Yes. Um, she's also going to fend any questions. So if you've got a question, if you could just type it in, um, then Debbie can feed it into the appropriate uh, point in the in the proceedings. Um, so was, yeah, Jazz, thank you very much. Thank you, Jazz. Really Excellent. Helpful. Uh, and fundraising is as hard as the training. I mean, you've really got to focus on the fundraising. One thing that I found that worked really well was getting people to having a grid uh, of times and getting people to predict your finish time for the London Marathon. And, you know, you can have it minute intervals um, and get people to buy buy a minute for, you know, five quid or something. And you can very quickly uh, earn you know quite a bit oh, yeah. of fundraising sure. money that way. For sure. Um, so we're going to go on to the um, the top five training tips. Um, number one, um, certainly, we get quite a few people that you know play football or play netball or hockey or and they say, "Well, I'm 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 really fit," um, and and it is great, and those are great pastimes, great sports, but endurance training and the requirements for a marathon are totally different from those activities um moss i'm sure will explain some of that in his in his uh, conditioning uh, side of things but you you just you just need different um requirements it's it's the repetition of one action thousands and thousands of times with your body weight going through that action um, that causes the problem. And if you if you try to rush that, then your body will object big style and you'll end up with an injury um, or you know, start with a niggle and then you'll end up with an injury. So you've got to realize that you're embarking on something that is, is different. You've got to treat it as something new. You've got to build up gradually um because physiological change it just takes time and it takes patience and the problem is that we're not very good with patience we think we know what we our bodies can do and we can make them do it but getting used to that impact getting used to that repetition is something that has to build up very gradually and ideally if you can and it's safe um, doing some of that off road um, is going to help the the impact side of things. So, yeah, very different and and takes takes very different requirements. Um, the the next thing is that naturally people get obsessed about the long run. Um, it's the first thing that they focus on. For some people, it's the only thing that they focus on, but. Whilst the long run is really important, um, it's also about it's about the sum of the parts. It's about all the other parts of the bricks in the wall that go to make up the endurance runner. So um, you need good speed endurance. And I don't mean speed. I mean speed endurance. You need to be able to hold a certain level of speed for a long time. That takes practice. But by doing that, that improves the speed of your long run. You need strength endurance so that you're very comfortable running on some hills, which is going to help your overall condition and leg strength. You need good body conditioning. <clears throat> you need good mobility. And obviously, you need good endurance. Now, good endurance does come from the long run. But to start with, the long run it needs to be at a level that your body can cope with. So it needs to be at a level where it's not painful. There is no point in just pushing yourself through pain, thinking, well, I'm making myself tougher. I'm showing my mind that I can do this. Therefore, it must be doing me good. No, the danger is that you're pushing it too hard 
that you're going too long because your body's not ready for it and your muscles are objecting, your bones and your tendons will object and you'll pick up an overuse injury. So patience again, running um, the long run at the right level for you and at starting point, that might be a run walk. Starting point might be a brisk walk. Um, starting point might be 45 minutes. It doesn't matter, but it has to be right for you. And the long run to start with, you want to be taking it easy because if you're taking it easy, you're allowing the body to get used to that impact and repetition and you're helping the body develop more blood capillaries, which are going to enhance your ability to transport oxygen around the body, which then means that you're providing the muscle cells with more energy. So there is a science behind making the long run easy and making it conversational. If you can go out and have your long run, even if you have to chat to your little imaginary friend on your shoulder and the rest of the world think you're mad, well, they think you're mad anyway because you're out running, um, that's what you want. What you don't want to be doing at this stage is trying to run too long and puffing and panting and thinking, this is just horrible. You want the long run to be pleasant. You can look at your surroundings. You can enjoy a bit of nature. And you come back and you think, yeah, box ticked, job done. That's all it's about. So that's that one. Um, it kind of, as part of that theme, it's so important that you have the correct training plan for you. That's all that matters. Doesn't matter what your friend's doing. Doesn't matter what people down the club are doing. It doesn't even matter what you think you should be doing. It's about what your body can accommodate, um, about what it can, it can, it can do the training. It can recover from the training. It adapts. It gets stronger and better and moves on. If you're pushing your body so hard that it's actually thinking, "Cool, this is this is hard. I'm on my knees here. This is just horrible." You, you, you're not recovering. It's too hard for you. You will at some point break and then you're going to miss two or three weeks. And that's not what we want. So smart training, the correct training, and and, and our plans introduce quite a few different types of training that all come together to be, as I said, these this brick, the bricks in the wall for the end game. It, you know, it doesn't matter if one training session is feels good or doesn't feel good. It's not it's not the end of the world. You don't get the gold medal for that training session. It's designed to improve one area of your body for the big day. So that's what's important. So making sure that we're doing the right things, that the thing the training you're doing is appropriate for the challenge that you face and you're training at the correct intensity are all vital um, when it comes to making sure that it's the right training plan for you. And I think also what we should say at this point is we've still got six months to go. You know, we're not yeah. nowhere near the point that the the, the, the kind of person, uh, athlete in the yeah. physical shape that you want to be on in April. So there's a long journey to go, enjoy the journey, um, but don't expect everything right now. It's it's you know six months to no, go down the line. It is that it is just that it's it's about these building blocks to build your wall, and you just need to keep putting the bricks in the wall and doing them correctly. And as this side slide says, it's about maintaining consistency at the correct intensity. That is the key nugget of preparation for endurance training. It's it's it is repetition. Um, there are some weeks where you'll find it boring and you have to rem remind yourself of all the stuff that Jazz just said about the great cause that you're training for, the loved ones that you're remembering in your training, because it will get to the point where you get a little bit fed up with it. Um, but you'll get even more fed up with it if you're pushing your body too hard. You'll get even more fed up with it if you have to go and visit Moss and be on his table getting a, a physio. So trying to be smart and steady away and consistent and just keep ticking the boxes is the most important thing. And to do that, you need to think about the correct intensity in all the supporting information that Debbie sends you. It, it goes on about understanding your training and understanding the intensity of each of the different types of training that you do. And it doesn't matter 
you might be sat there thinking, well, I'm a complete beginner. This different type of training doesn't apply to me. I just go out and run. If you follow the plan that we send you with the different types of training, you will become a more efficient a more economical and a more effective runner. And the training allows you to have different gears. So at the moment, you might think, well, I only have one pace. That's probably very true. But the... the um, if, if you're if you're walking, if you're you yeah, know, if you're you're not, yeah, it doesn't yeah. really matter where your no. starting point is. No, it doesn't matter. Consistency yeah. is it doesn't matter where your starting point is, but if you follow the training as it's introduced, you'll be doing different things that you're not used to doing, but it does in the end provide you with gears so that you've got several gears above your long run tempo. And that's what makes a really good endurance runner. So that when you come back to long run tempo, it's that much faster than it was where you are now if that makes if that makes sense so to finish off really it's it's about smart training it's, every time you put your running shoes on you want to think now why am i putting them on what what am i about to go and do and how am i going to execute it it's it's up to you as a thinking runner and the, the bit that a lot of runners don't use muscles is the the top two inches. If you can become a thinking runner, then you're going to be smart and you're going to know why you're putting your running shoes on. And when you're out there running, you, you're the one that's got to make the changes in the effort level. Now, our plans are in, are in time and effort. We want you to understand what it means to be a conversational effort. We want you to understand what it means to be at threshold effort. It's all explained in there. But if you get that, that will be your biggest light bulb moment. You're suddenly, you'll, you'll think, oh, that's how it's supposed to feel. That's why I'm doing it. That's the improvement it's going to give me. <clears throat> Whereas if we just said to you, right, we want you to go and run for X number of miles. And, it, and in some of the plans, later, much later on, as you get close to the marathon, there is some of that. But if we said to you, we want you to go out and run X number of miles, if you're running... 15 minute miles you could be out there all day and if we said to you we want you to run x pace regardless of the terrain the temperature how you felt the fact you haven't followed tracy's nutritional advice or you're trying to do it with a bit of a niggle you'd force yourself to run at that pace whereas if you and and you'd break down so effort level and time and forget about the pace the, and it's not a natural thing to do, but forget about the pace and run to the correct effort level for the right amount of time. And you will see yourself get faster over the weeks and months to come. As Debbie says, you're just starting the journey. And, and even if you're starting this journey with a lot of experience and are a good runner now, you are only going to get better by following these plans. So patience is a virtue. I wasn't very good at it. And I learned, I learned the hard way to understand my training. I learned the, the hard way to be patient. And that allowed me to run two hours, 17 minutes as a 40 year old. So it can, you know, you can do this. It just requires thinking about. So that's my top five tips. I don't know if there's any questions I need to cover off. There's just one quick question. A girl called Kerry has a message to say, um, she has down at her club, uh, they suggest that she should be running up to two hours already at this point. I think it kind of goes to basically yeah. what we've just we're talking about. But no, I mean at the it it at two hours at the moment is not not required. Um and how long you're running at the moment really depends on your experience and, and how long you've been running. But you know, if you're running 45 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes at the moment, that's great. But I don't think we need to stray into the two-hour level until we get a few more weeks down down the track, in, perhaps into the new year. Yeah. Um, but it, it is an individual thing. Um, but uh, hopefully that... Do we have any pain for people to run walking, Jeffers, etc.? Yeah, we, we have. I mean, I love this phrase, Jeffers. Um, <laughs> the run-walk thing, we do. Um, I... I'm not a fan of 
um, the kind of really short intervals of you know one minute walk, one minute run. Um, I think everybody's capable of something a little more than that as long as you're doing it at the right intensity. So we do have uh, run walk plans um, that gradually then take you on to more running. And we do talk about in the plans that if 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 you need if you feel that you can cope with uh, running a little bit more that's fine if you if you feel you need to walk a little bit more that's fine so yeah we do have a whole range of plans for whole whole all levels including a run walk strategy uh, so beth if you if you want to chat to us about that maybe you could email me next week and uh, we can certainly um chat further um john has also messaged that he finds it difficult focusing on miles per week and pace per mile some, something he obviously needs to work on. I'm sure lots of people need to work on. Yeah, you know, it's, it is one of those things. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's look. You know, at the moment, if you if you go out, let's talk about you know, if you go out for your long run and you just run along conversationally, and let's say it says in your plan that we've asked you to run for 75 minutes, it doesn't matter whether what what distance you cover or what pace you're doing it at, as long as it's at the right intensity of conversational. If you're doing that. That's allowing you to develop the the muscular fatigue resistance and 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 in, improve condition of muscles and bones and tendons etc. And it allows you to have the energy to do the other training during the week, which is the area that is going to improve that pace. So don't worry about that, and it, it will come. It will gradually come. And as you're doing the threshold type running, that will also focus your mind on oh. I'm running at this effort and this is producing nine minutes per mile. That's what it feels like. Um, but you don't have to force yourself to get there. A quick question before we move on um, from Shirley saying she can do 15K at the minute, takes her two hours, worried that she won't be able to get any further. It already feels like a limit. We're, that, si we're six months away, yeah, Shirley. That, We've got bags and bags. But that's the time. thing is, yes, at the moment, but what we don't want you is running up to your limit at the moment thinking, God, this is horrible. We want you to be relaxed about it, doing doing it nice and easily. It, it, at the moment, it probably is the maximum, but it, by doing the other training, by focusing on it's some of the other work, the, some of the parts, you're going to get into fantastic condition. You're, that, that long run is gradually going to extend. By doing the thresholds, you're going to become more efficient and more effective and faster. And therefore, the whole thing will start to slot into place. Whereas if you just keep trying to force the long run, it ain't going to get any better. So, uh, yeah, just patience, patience. You'll get there. It'll be absolutely fine. Uh, just one thing. We will share at the end detail, our contact details. So if you haven't got a plan at this point, um, yeah, don't could. worry about that. Um, you can, we, can, uh, we can sort that out with you. We'll, we'll message. You can message us, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, in the meantime, yeah, we'll come back that. for any more questions at, at, at the, the end, end. For, for Keith. So so we're going to hand over to Moss Clifford. Moss um, is from Warrior Rehab, and he's our top physio. Um, and uh, he's going to give you some excellent tips on uh, staying out of trouble. <laughs> hey, hey, Keith, Debbie. James, hey, thanks yeah. for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, great to join you all. Such a great cause. Um, and great to see people planning so far out from the marathon. Uh, I'm used to dealing with people who, uh, like you've touched on, start a little bit too late, do a little bit too yeah. much, oh, and then expect a bit too much from you their, their bodies. Um, so I'm just going to pull up my uh, my presentation for you guys. If uh, uh, just by the way, if anybody's joining and they haven't muted themselves, if you wouldn't mind, um, that would be uh, really helpful. So as uh, Debbie and Keith said, my name is Moss. I'm a specialist sports physio at Warrior Sports Rehab in London. Um, so apologies, actually, despite my background, I am in London. So you may hear lots of sirens. It seems to be a quite a common theme uh, in London. Um, give you an idea about my background. Uh, I qualified with a degree in sports science and sports rehab many, many years ago and worked in the fitness industry uh, and in professional rugby. Uh, as a physio, I've worked in pro rugby with summer and winter Olympians, um, professional dancers, uh, lots and lots of people, and normal people, of course, as well. Uh, in terms of my running experience, uh, quite a, a strong interest in biomechanical analysis. I've also trained marathon runners as a sports scientist uh, and helped uh, iron men or an iron women through, as well as military athletes as well. Um, so five things to talk about. Obviously, that's the team for the day. 
Um, very simple, five must do. So from my point of view, five things that you must do or should do uh, to try and keep yourself going through your training. Uh, balance, variety, Keith's kind of touched on that a little bit already. Pain, very important from a, a physio point of view and, and from a running point of view. Uh, and switching off to switch on or switching on to switch off, depending on the way you want to you want to do it. Um, so the five must do's. When people start running, uh, as Keith's touched on, what we forget to do is get prepared to run. We think it's a very simple thing. Slip on our shoes, put our shorts on or our tights on and get out and go. But actually, the, the reality is for new runners that anywhere between 30 and 60 percent will get injured. Um one of the things that you can do to try and prevent that is get prepared to run. By that, I mean, look at a little bit of strengthening, uh, make sure you've got the right shoes, visit your doctor, discuss any health problems you have. Um, think about where you're going to fit it in, where you're going to fit your rest and recovery in. Um, if you're new to running and new to exercise, it means also that you're what we call your training age is quite low. But that would mean your body hasn't had time to adapt uh, to the load, to the stress, to the intensity that you're going to be putting it through. So you do need to be patient, as Keith and Debbie touched on. Uh, and Jazz, actually, with fundraising, you've got to trust the process. You've got to take little steps and build towards your bigger goal. Um, and that's what I mean by by saying get prepared to run. Um, so in terms of must do, so get prepared to run and then single leg balance. Now, very simple exercise, standing on one leg. That's going to just test your foot and ankle control, your knee control, your hip control. And that mimics the, the, the action of running. So when you're putting one foot in front of the other repeatedly, you've got to be able to control and balance on that leg. Um, the more you practice, the easier it gets. Just to make that single leg balance a little bit harder, a single leg dip. The reason we choose that, it, it's like a single leg squat. Again, you're just controlling your lower limb as you land on your foot. Your knee has to absorb the force. Your hip has to absorb the force. The reason that's so important is um, if the muscles in those areas are strong, it means that you're using the muscles to support yourself and drive yourself along rather than putting stress on the tendons and on the joints in those areas. Glute bridges, a very, very simple exercise. Um, lying on your back, feet about shoulder width apart, lifting your bum off the floor and holding it. So again, we're working on supporting the uh, the hips, using the hamstrings, using the calf muscles. So that again, when you're landing as you run, you've got that support through the lower limb to keep you going. Calf raises, again, attached to the foot. And sorry, the calf muscles attached to the foot and ankle. Every time you land, all your weight's going through your foot and ankle. If you imagine, roughly seven times your body weight goes through your foot when you're walking alone. And when you're running, that goes up exponentially. So it's very important to be strong in the calf area. Um, balance. So what I mean by, by balance is that when you're running, as Keith said, there's lots of things to think about in terms of your intensity, uh, the volume, the distance, the time. Um, you'll probably know from your programs how many runs you're going to do per week, the intensity of the running, the surface you might be running on, so it may be tarmac or you may have a track nearby that you want to train on. Um, you probably know what your shoes and kit is going to look like. Uh, work and life stress. So you're going to try and think about where you're going to put your runs, where it's going to fit in, in around your work, uh, your family life, your friends, uh, any activities that you like to do outside running. Um, those things all have a toll on, on the body. Now, overtraining, uh, or doing too much isn't just about doing too much exercise it's about where you fit all of these things in and, and the emotional toll it takes the physical toll the cognitive toll it takes on your body where you can help to balance them out is by being prepared looking at some strength training now that could be just using your body weight as i talked about with single leg balance uh, single leg dips glute bridges or if you've done some weight training before, keeping that up or just changing how you do it so that it just helps your body prepare for the, the long runs ahead. Nutrition, obviously, which is going to come up later. And also probably the most important thing from a physio point of view, believe it or not, it's the thing that helps you recover probably more than anything else, sleep. And we'll talk about rest. Now, sleep and rest are two different things. 
rest is allowing the, the mind to settle down, um, giving your brain a chance to uh, recover from the stresses of the day. That can be sitting quietly as you have your lunch, sitting in the park as you have a cup of coffee, whatever it be. It just means avoiding cognitive input. So very often when I work with elite athletes when we go abroad, after training, they'll have half an hour to an hour of cognitive rest. They will literally sit, no phone usage. They may go out for a walk. Uh, anything just to allow the brain to switch off for a little while. The brain is the biggest user of energy in the body, so it's important to let that, that settle after exercise. And then recovery, that's the sum of all of those things, the preparation, the strength, the nutrition, the sleep, the rest, and then that allows you to recover. Um, if you don't get these things right, what you start to do is get an overload on the body. Now, overload, or all injuries are caused by overload in essence. Um, we tend to say it works on, on a continuum. Um, so fascia, which is a tissue that surrounds muscles and runs in between them. Muscle tendon, which is where the muscle attaches onto the bone. Now, generally, when you start training, if, um, if you start to feel a little niggle, we would say generally it's around the, the fascia. Um, now, that's not always strictly scientifically true. But if you, if you let that fester, then the muscle starts to become irritated. Then if the muscle becomes irritated, uh, um, becomes sore, painful, it means then the tendon, which is where the muscle attaches to the bone, becomes unsettled. And then you might develop a tendonitis, maybe an Achilles tendonitis, a tendonitis around the, the bum muscles. That makes it harder to run. And then eventually, if you're not using your muscles and your tendons to control your posture while you run, there's a risk of a bony injury. Now, if you can, and it's always important, Try and get it early. Try and get any injury or niggle tackle with straight away. Um, the sooner you do it, the easier it is. So I would say if you already have a niggle or something that's bothering you, go and see a physiotherapist. Come and see me in London, but get a tackle straight away before you start to get into it. Um, when you're two months out, it may be much harder to tackle. If you can tackle it now, do. Um, if I can just get this slide to go. Sorry, guys. Okay, so the next one is that's important is uh, variety. Um, when you're training, uh, as Keith said, it's important to think about where you're going to train. So we tend to say embrace change. Variety keeps things fresh, um, means that your body's kept guessing, but in a good way. Um, as Keith touched on, sometimes you can get to run in a park. That would be fabulous. That allows you just to um, load your body in a different way. If you're on concrete or tarmac all the time, that repetition of loading in the same way just takes its toll. Sometimes if you go into a park or you've got a, a wood to run through, it means that you have to work more on your foot placement, control around the, the foot and ankle, the knee. It slows your pace down, allows you to work at a level that's probably more suitable. Um, also helps with the mind as well. It keeps the mind fresh and allows you to recover a bit better. Um, the other thing we talk about, sorry, that, Slide hasn't moved on there for you guys, has it? There we go. Um, the other thing is thinking about um, training. As Keith said, when, when you're training, if you're going too fast, you're going to put a huge amount of stress through the body. A really good saying is, as fast as slow and slow as fast. So if you work at the right pace for you and you stick with the process, over a period of time, your body will adapt and you will become faster, but you have to be patient with it. Um, that's the key bit. Patience and consistency, is, as Keith has said. Um, pain. So we often think of pain as a bad thing. Um, it's actually defined as an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience that's associated with actual or potential tissue damage. Um, it doesn't always mean you're having damage. So some pain we talk about as being nice pain. I'm sure we've all had perhaps a, a massage or a shoulders rub. It's not very comfortable but it can be uh, a nice uncomfortable. Um, if we didn't have pain, for instance, we wouldn't know if we were burning our hand, if we stepped on a, on a, on a nail or a thumbtack. So it's very important to think of pain in, in a different way. Now, what is important though is to re realize when that pain is, is perhaps um, a warning sign. So if you are um, training, um, as a general rule of thumb, when it comes to niggles, if your pain is a two or three out of 10, 
and it's gone say within 10 minutes of it, it coming on or, or, or of you stopping running, that's probably manageable and that's probably okay. But if it's a three, uh, three or four out of 10 and it's lasting more than 10 minutes, say after you train, then it's probably worth getting it checked out straight away. Or if you're getting pain, say 24 hours after your run, you get pain at night when you're at rest. Um, so say for instance, your hip aches or your knee aches, while you're not doing anything, then it's definitely worth going to see uh, your physio. Um, another corner warn warning sign with pain, we would say is if, if it's sore at the start of your run, and it starts to settle as you get going, then that's also probably worth checking out. So some tendon problems um, manifest themselves in that way. They can be sore when you first start going, as you get going, they ease up, uh, and then afterwards or, or the day after, they ache. And that sometimes can be a sign that you're doing too much and your body hasn't, uh, hasn't adapted to what you're doing. So that's definitely when it's worth getting things checked out. Um, so our next one, just trying to get it to go. Sorry, there's a bit of a lag here. There we go. Ooh, we'll go back one. So last year we did a survey when we had a, a little bit more time. Um, these are the kind of body parts that you'll start to feel ache as you run. Okay. Uh, as you can see, two of the biggest areas, or three of the biggest areas, we've got your glute, your bum muscles. Your hamstrings to the back of your thigh and your hip and groin okay now the hip and groin and the glute will go hand in hand if you're not strong enough through that that kinetic chain so basically strong enough in the muscles around the hip around the knee uh, and around the, the ankle so the calf muscles these are the areas that take the stress and strain and that's where you'll start to get your aches and pains so it's really important to get in there tackle those early be strong in those areas so that when you are doing the runs um, that Keith and Debbie have put out for you, you manage comfortably. Um, switch on to switch off. So as I kind of touched on uh, a little while ago, um, it's very important. Everybody knows, or you probably know already from your plans, how many runs you're going to be doing. Um, what you may not have thought of is how many strength sessions you're going to be doing. And also when you're going to fit in your rest how are you going to get enough sleep and how are you going to recover? Now, the difference between an elite and an amateur athlete or a professional and a part-time athlete isn't necessarily how hard you train. All of you guys are going to be putting in huge amounts of effort. But the key, key difference is how much rest you get. That's what sets elite and, and amateur athletes apart. So it's very important to plan when you're going to get your rest in and also when you're going to get your strength sessions in. Um, as I said earlier on, very often when I work with elite athletes away, um, after a training session, they will have an hour of cognitive rest, try and let their brain brain relax. Now, I know that's not always possible when we've got work, um, but try and find other ways to do it. If you have a commute, can you sit uh, and relax and listen to music? Something that allows you to switch off. Um, can you take time off for the weekend to have a, a, a nap? Um, just try and fit that rest and recovery in as well. That allows your body to adapt. Sleep. Sleep and rest are when the magic happens. Um, very, very important to think about it. Um, and that's basically it for us. So um, I have attached some um, uh, a summary here, obviously, but I'll just skip on to this. So in terms of strength training, just attach this very, very simple program that you could look to do. Um, obviously, you can build on that. And if you're, if you're already a bit stronger and you're doing some more, that's fabulous. Keep that up. As you can see, we've got it split into to, um, just three exercises. So the glute bridge, the single leg balance, and the calf raises. You can add in those single leg balances, but with uh, um, a little single leg dip. So I'm talking about trying to do it for about 30 seconds, just so you can work on your balance. And then you can build it up over a period of about five weeks. So it's probably approximately five minutes of work three times a week. So not a huge amount, but it could actually prevent a, a lot of problems going forward. Um, and then also soft tissue release. So if you've got muscles that are a bit achy after your run, um, just using a massage ball, a foam roll or a tennis ball, you could start to rub your calves, the bottom of your foot, work through your hamstrings and your thigh muscles um, and just try and release those things off so that after your, your run, you recover, feel a bit more comfortable and you're ready to go for your next session. Um, 
We do have a package on offer for you guys if you're looking to come come through to see us. Uh, 10% off for all full potential runners um, with me in London. Um, we are also going to give an online offering. Um, the running assessment, though, so we're, we're going to offer a, a triage screen. Um, that What's important to realize is that, that triage is only if you're not injured. If you have an injury, it's worth coming to see me in person. Or, of course, if you're not in London, go and see your local physio uh, for a proper opinion. Um, if you do come and see us, offer a, a personalized strength, mobility and flexibility management program and any suggestions on your running mechanics, if required. Um, any questions? Uh, there's no questions that have come in so far, Moss, but I would just, one thing that I would um, say is to, when you, uh, to ask you, is when you would suggest people do their s &C. Is it, is um, it a day when they're running or, or a different day or? Well, you can actually fit it in wherever you need to. You can do it on the day you run. Um, if you do, I would say perhaps do it in the morning if you're doing an evening run or vice versa. Um, again, depends on how many runs you've got during the week. If you have a heavy week and you've got three or four runs, it might be that you try and fit it in on the days that you've got you've got off or, or sorry, off running. Um, again, you know, the, the, the program isn't particularly heavy or the basics aren't particularly heavy. So you could fit it on the days you run if you need to. If you're time poor, you just fit it in where you can. Um, but the key bit, as Keith said, with all the running too, is consistency. Um, if you're doing something consistently, that's when you get the most benefit. It just takes time and effort. I think the, I think the other thing, Moss, is it doesn't have to be a massive session. I mean, you, exactly. you, you could do 10 or 15 yeah. minutes. Uh, that you, you could fit that in on a running day. Yeah. Um, whereas if it was going to be say an hour, then uh, you know it needs it needs a day on its own with with some good recovery. Yeah. And I, think, I think also is don't beast yourself. It, it's not exactly. it's not aimed at trying to kill you. Exactly. Well, if you look at the program I attached there, and, and obviously the slides will go out to you guys. Um, it's not going to. It's not going to be no. a killer. It's not a killer uh, at all. Very a question from Gary Moss. Uh, he says he's always suffered from Achilles tendonitis after a long run, but it goes away after one day. What do you? What would you suggest? Ooh, uh, without seeing if it's a, a tendonitis, uh, if it's been definitely diagnosed, it's worth thinking about doing some uh, um, strengthening before he starts getting into full training. It may be some irritation around the area that needs looking at. Um, especially if it's been a been a recurring theme, when the when the volume starts to go up and you get closer to the race, unless you've you've tackled it, I think uh, um, it, it could be uh, it could be a potential problem. So I definitely go and see your come and see me, of course, uh, or go and see your local physio, get it checked out properly before you start getting into the full training. I yeah. quite agree because as the as we're just starting with the training at the minute, as the, naturally the training is going to start to you know load up as we start to get into the more tastier yeah. session certainly into next year so you don't want to leave it that long that's what i think, I, think <clears throat> I mean the point you made about you know standing on one leg and checking out your balance, balance exactly, yeah. running is basically hopping from one leg to another in a, in a very basic way so if you're collapsing in or your hip can't support you or your ankle's weak or you know those that's just going to compound and compound and compound and that's why I think that's why people get injured, isn't it, really? Is that lack of... Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's not something we're used to. As I said, when we're walking along, we've got about six or seven times of body weight going through our foot, just walking. So and that goes up exponentially when you run. So you have to have that strength and control. Uh, and again, it doesn't need to be complicated. As you said, the sessions don't need to be very heavy. They just need to be done consistently for the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments, for that training age I talked about. That just takes consistency of effort. Um, you know, for the body to develop and, and become stronger, it takes consistency. Um, I often say to people, uh, Olympic athletes talk about maybe four hundredths of a second improvement over four years. Yet, as novice or, or amateur athletes, we want to become marathon runners and very fast marathon runners in a very short period of time. But it takes time and effort over a long period to to get that 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 change. So it reiterates what you say, Keith, that consistency, that patience, follow the process, then you'll get the benefits. It's um, it's very easy to write sub four on a form. And yeah. then when you start the training, you realize what sub four really means. 
But, you know, it's, yeah, great stuff. I mean, Moss will go into an awful lot more detail when we do our uh, in-person training day in January, uh, BH, BHF HQ. Um, but no, fabulous, Moss. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, you know, again, people, this, this is really important stuff is being prepared to run. And at the moment, that's why the plans that have started are, are manageable to allow your body to start to adapt, but you've also got to do this conditioning work along with it so that when it ramps up further, your body will be prepared and you won't get injured. So yeah. but thank you, Moss. That's thank you very excellent. much. Excellent. Um, There's a few more questions which we'll cover at the very end, actually, because we want to uh, get Tracy to yeah. come on board and give her words of wisdom about all things nutrition and hydration. So if you're able to stop sharing your screen, Moss, that would be... There you go. That's it. Perfect. Thank you very much. And Tracy, over to you whenever you can share. Yeah, great. There we go. Hi, great. everyone. Thank you. Um, want me next? I'll just start sharing my screen and then we'll go from there. Perfect. How's that, everyone? Good? Yep, that's perfect. perfect. Thank you. Brilliant. Great. Um, yeah, so um, nutrition. Um, these are going to be my top nutrition tips. And I, I think I'd like to point out at uh, this, this point in time that, as we've been saying, we're quite early on in the process for marathons. So uh, my tips are really to get you start thinking about, you know, what you're doing in the here and now so that you are sort of... Um, putting together I mean Keith talks about the bricks in the wall I talk about layers in a cake but that you you get your your cake foundation set so when you're starting to build your distance speed etc that you are you know you are supporting your body with uh, good nutrition so I'm uh, Tracy Park I'm a dietitian at the BHF and I've been at the BHF now for uh, quite some time probably 12 or 13 years um, I'm also a sports dietitian and uh, I work predominantly with um, endurance athletes, so whether that's cyclists or, or runners, but, I, but I've been working with athletes um, for a long time now. So hopefully um, you'll find these next pointers um, helpful um, at this be beginning stage of your uh, training. Um, so this slide really, I think, encompasses what uh, Moss and Keith and Debbie have been saying is that, you know, when we're talking about uh, a marathon, it's it's about the combination of everything that's going to result in success for you. And um, it's not just about your training plan. So I always think that when you think about nutrition, it's a bit like planning a long road journey. Actually, you may have your car, which is your body and uh, a map your training plan, but actually if you don't have the right fuel at the right time, you're, you're not gonna progress or you're not going to reach your destination. So nutrition um, is often a part of the process that because we all eat and we, we probably think we're all doing okay, we, we think we're doing the right thing. So this is just to highlight some areas that you, you may want to think a little bit more about. So marathon preparation involves more than just your training. Nutrition is key throughout your training. So right at the beginning, when you're running and recovery and at each stage of your, your progression. And when you eat the right things at the right time, what you'll find, as with everything else, your running actually will become easier too. So now is actually this really early stage is um, the perfect time to get your, your diet in shape. And I think one of the... The things which is good to remember is actually, regardless of your activity, everyone needs a healthy diet. So actually your diet requirements um, for runners and athletes versus the rest of the population actually doesn't change. But you do need to think more carefully about what you're putting on your plate. And as your training progresses, you may need to think a little bit more about the types of food, which foods do you perhaps need to eat a little bit more. But at this um, early stage, really, before as you're starting your training, it's it's a good idea just to think about your basic diet and your general diet and make sure that's in order 
to help with your progression. So what, what do we mean here in the UK? I know that we've got a lady here from uh, Canada, but our, our, the basis of our diet is what we call the eat well plate. And this picture is just a pictorial representation of roughly the types of food and the proportions of the food. So if you're looking at your plate, what you should be eating. So if we, uh, let's start with carbohydrates, that's often the one that, you know, everybody's concerned when we're, we're doing activity. And we need to think in this world where we all think that we should be eating less carbohydrate, carbohydrates bad for you, low carb diets. Actually, when you're doing activity, you've got to remember that carbohydrates are your muscles, your brain's best friend. So you do need to think about making sure that you are eating enough carbohydrates to fuel your runs. And it's a fine balance. And we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a minute. But the, the types of carbohydrates you're choosing are the things to think about. We need to be choosing those carbohydrates that release energy nice and slowly. Um, these are the carbohydrates that make sure that your muscle um, muscles are you know, when you digest your carbohydrate, it ends up being uh, glucose and that fuel goes into your muscles to store as gly glycogen. And the aim of um, the nutrition is to try and make sure that your muscle glycogen stores are always full. So you're always starting a training session, a run, etc., with a full tank. And these carbohydrates that release the energy slowly. So um, carbohydrates with more fiber in them are the fuels and the foods that your body prefers over things like cakes, biscuits, um, et cetera, which are fine to have in, in moderation. But during, if you're thinking about your basic meals, these are the carbohydrates that you need to be filling up on. When we talk about protein, protein actually doesn't give us much, much energy. Your body only uses protein for energy if we don't have enough carbohydrates on board. And when we're doing activity and running, et cetera, it's, it's more important for us to think about our protein to help ensure our muscles grow and repair and recover. So you're building muscle, building strength, and that's what supports your training process. And the best way to think about protein foods is in, in two arms, really, those proteins that provide us with calcium. So as we know, calcium is, is really good for bone health. And those foods that give us iron, so iron for healthy blood vessels, that helps make sure that your, your blood is transporting nutrients and oxygen to your um, muscles that will be working hard throughout, throughout your training. So uh, protein foods, regardless, can be um, animal-based or plant-based, depending on your, your food preferences, but make sure you'll be choosing uh, lean protein, so that's anything from lean meats and chicken, eggs, fish, including oily fish, to all your lovely plant-based proteins, such as beans, peas, pulses, uh, nuts, seeds, etc., and include your dairy products. And again, that can be a dairy or your non-dairy non, uh, alternative. So it gives you, uh, you know, a great variety and combination to be including in your diet. Um, let's not forget about plenty of fruit and vegetables. They're a great contributor to your carbohydrate intake really important um, fiber providers, energy providers, and um, a good boost for your immune system too. And if you think that a lot of your training is gonna be happening over the winter months, um, you really should be aiming to ensure that you are having your five portions of fruit and vegetables a day. And I can't leave out fats, you know, obviously working for the British Heart Foundation, advocating healthy fats for your healthy heart, but we also know that healthy fats such as omega-3s, um, help to keep your joints healthy. So, you know, it all comes together. A healthy diet is good for your um, your heart, your general health and, and, and your bones. So when it comes to fats, think about, you know, the fats that are uh, healthy vegetable based fats, um, along with things like nuts, seeds and, and oily fish. So that's the sort of the combination um, you should be looking at. And questions, really easy questions to ask yourself are, uh, are you eating carbohydrates? Are you including a wide variety of protein in your diet? So both calcium and containing uh, protein foods. Um, are you having some carbohydrate and protein at each meal? Um, are you having five portions of fruit and veg a day? And these are questions to keep asking yourself as you go through your training, because um, if you're getting to a point in your training where you think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm onto my next stage, I, I, I should be doing a longer distance or far faster times, and you're not meeting those um, targets, 
you know, do have a think back and think, well, actually, I wonder if that's because I'm not starting my uh, training session with a full tank of uh, energy. Am I not eating enough? Am I running out? So all those questions, ask yourself as you're continuing to progress with your training. And nine times out of ten, you'll find it's perhaps you you know you're not you haven't got the basics of your diet um, quite right. So how much should I be eating? I touched upon um, you know getting the balance. And it's key to remember, really, um, you don't need to overdo carbohydrates and calories, particularly at this uh, early stage where you may be only doing easy 5K, 10K, stretching Pilates, uh, strengthening activities. So there's no need to overload your, your plate with carbohydrates at this point in time. It's not saying that if you are craving a biscuit or anything like that, you know, go for a habit, but you know, those are the nice to haves when it comes to looking at your diet for um, your, 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 your training. Um, and it's an easy way to think of it actually is to think of, of thirds. So if you have a look at your plate, a third of your plate should be protein, a third carbohydrates and a third fruit and vegetables. And that, that gives you quite a nice visual balance to check that you may be getting it right. And, um, People are always are quite fixated about, you know, how much for me. And in a really at this stage, a, a fantastic way to do it is to just look at your hand. And that helps personalize how much you should be eating because, you know, the bigger hand you have, the bigger portion size it is. So generally people with bigger people will get bigger portions and smaller people will get smaller portions. And this actually goes across the age ranges and is useful in, in terms of managing intake with children as well. So um, a really good a visual aid to think about, am I getting uh, not only the right foods, but am I having them in the right amounts? So another a really frequent question is, is this, should I eat before or running? And um, in short, really, it's better to eat before a run because running on an empty stomach, empty fuel tank often leads to uh, sluggish ses sessions and can leave you continually hungry for the rest of the day. So it can mean that you just you're overeating when you don't really need to. So again, this is where I was saying, you know, keep asking those questions about, you know, how much carbohydrate and protein are you are you seeing that you're having? Because, you know, if you're if you're feeling sluggish before or after a, a session, it may be that you're not eating your meals at the right time. So as I said, um, what you need to remember, what you eat is only useful once it's been digested. You don't want to be running when you've got undigested food in your, your stomach. That's what can give rise to sort of a runner's uh, tummy. And a mixed meal, um, as you can see, when you've got carbohydrate, protein and fat, roughly takes around two to four hours to be digested. So that's your ballpoint um, park, a ball figure really in terms of how long before a, a run you should be eating so roughly about two or three hours before exercising so if you're a, a like to run or train at lunchtime then the meal that's important is actually what you have in the morning so making sure that you're having porridge with milk and some fruit or eggs on whole grain toast something like that that will keep you going until you um, do your exercising at lunchtime uh, the same goes if you're exercising early evening then your lunchtime meal then becomes in, in, important now if you're an early morning runner um, you can probably get away with not eating before exercise, but that's only really if it's low intensity or for less than an hour, because you then won't have enough energy carbohydrates to support anything longer than that. But if you're going to do that, then it's really important to have something to eat soon after to recover and refuel. So that's making sure that you're getting carbohydrate in the bloodstream and back into your muscle store. But just be aware um, um, as you start training and doing races, et cetera, they tend to be training races. They tend to be in the morning. So at this point, it's it's really handy to get into the habit of trying to have something um, before you run in the morning, if possible. OK, so enough of food, but hydration. How much should you be drinking? So um, we all know there's plenty of general health benefits from keeping well hydrated. Um, and whether you're training or not, um, you, you know, just from uh, if you haven't been drinking enough, how much more tired you feel, it affects your concentration and makes you more irritable. But um, so you can see that it's really important just for a general health 
wise recommendation you need to be um, drinking enough how much do you need in general actually it's around six to eight glasses so that's 200 mils of fluid a day but as you'll know as you start um, doing more exercise then that um, requirement will step up quite significantly uh, particularly when you're doing runs that are over an hour and actually, the colour of your urine is a really good uh, guide. You know, ha have a look. The uh, yellow um, colour means that you're quite well hydrated. So anything that's darker, whether that's during the day or after your run, is a reminder that you probably should be drinking more. So, again, think think about that and, uh, you know, having, a, you know, your litre bottle of water on your desk at work or anything like that is a good reminder as to how much you um, are getting through during the day. So what should you be uh, drinking? Um, if you're exercising for less than an hour, water, water is, is, is best. You don't need to be taking any extra food or supplements um, because that basically um, sports drinks, um, et cetera, just um, extra calories that you don't need. And if you're looking at um, running a, as a bit of a tool to help manage your weight, you know, this is often a reason why people find that when they're doing the training, um, that, you know, then they're, they're not really seeing a change in, in their weight. It could be that, you know, you're eating too much or uh, taking on board too, too many sort of uh, supplements that you don't really need. And the, the bottom line is, Drink throughout the day. And if you uh, are starting exercise, aim to have about uh, two cups or 400 mils in the couple of hours before you go out. So you're starting any exercise or training well hydrated. And I'll just point out, we um, we, we talk much, I'll talk much more in depth in, in our subsequent um, sessions on, you know, the, the recommendations for when you're running much long, longer sessions. But I think for the most part, um, it, today's sessions really are about getting your basic plan, you know, in good shape as, you know, as a, you know, and you're doing things for habit. Um, so we'll be covering things like that later on. So you don't need to get too um, worried about um, what you should be doing when you're doing very long, long training sessions. Um, and so the question of do you need gels? And I've sort of touched upon that. And the answer is basically not not yet. It's uh, it's more important to get into the habit of eating regular healthy meals that, you know, makes you, it's making sure that your muscle glycogen remains topped up. Um, but as you you will need them later and it's not it doesn't have to be gels and uh, sports um, drinks. We'll be talking about other ways you can make sure that you are refueling um, during your long, long runs. Um, but that's for another time. So just in summary, um, use this this time now really to give your diet and MOT, ask those questions as to whether you you're, you're getting that balance in your everyday meals. Do focus on quality rather than quantity at the moment. Start to think about when you're, when you're eating. So get into the habit of eating before a run. Um, drink throughout the day. And uh, the focus really now should be on food, not supplements. And getting your diet in order really um, is key, along with everything else that helps support your training and recovery. And as we've been saying, the earlier you start, these small changes really add up. Um, the better prepared you will be for sort of your training as it starts stepping up in terms of distance and speed. And that's me. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Thank Tracy. You, Tracy. Well, we've got a couple of questions, as you may well imagine. Uh, how long to eat before a run? Uh, before so it, roughly uh, it should be around two to three hours before before you run because that as, as I mentioned that means that your body will have digested the food and it's already in your bloodstream uh, what I find what we find you know quite often if, if people have been suffering with runner's tummy um, either there's a lot of fiber in there that takes a, a, a lot of digestion uh, to be had or they're eating too close a big meal too close to a training session and when you've got undigested food in your stomach that your blood stays in your stomach trying to digest it rather than you know out uh, passing that oxygen and nutrients to your muscles which is where where it needs to be and that can be sort of a breakdown in your ability to finish a training session because you've got a tummy um, problem so roughly two to three hours a mixed meal well an error really isn't it i suppose yeah everyone's everyone's different no, yeah. Uh, 
Beth can, uh, has asked, can you lose weight whilst marathon training and still be able to fuel your runs? What you're, it's a slow process. A lot of people think because you're stepping up um, the your distance and, and time running that you're, you, you know, you're going to be losing a, a, a lot of weight. What you need to remember as you, um, as you up your exercise compared to normal, there's a lot of things that are going on. One, you need, you're right. You need to get that balance to make sure you, you're you fueling enough to get you through the process. But your body's adapting too. You're going to be growing muscle. Muscle weighs more than fat. So what you might see is your body shape change a little bit because you're gaining muscle and, and, and less of that sort of... Uh, numbers going down on this scale mm -hmm. so it's it's it is a balance but you 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 will find that you will feel fitter healthier stronger and you, you know your clothes and your 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 belts probably will be you know you can do them up a little bit uh, tighter so you you should be able to do it but a lot of people find it's a much slower process so you'll see the effects over time rather than you know you're going to be you know two or three pounds lighter each week perfect brilliant thank you uh somebody else has asked about has mentioned that they're ketogenic any uh suggestions for their training uh their uh their diet nutrition for their training yeah ketogenic so you're sort of encouraging high high fat uh diets um um, it's a, a really interesting one. And we we know that uh, for a, a very elite athletes, for those athletes that are iron man, iron women, their diets tend to be, uh, you know, high fat, high, high protein. Um, some protein foods include uh, carbohydrates. So things like your beans, lentils and pulses, uh, nuts and seeds. Again, high fat, high protein. Uh, those pulses um, are a, a good sort of source of carbohydrate too. Um, so th this is something that it would be better to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about it because I don't know how, how far ketogenic you really are. Those sorts of diets, the amount of carbohydrate can can change. Yeah. So um, it's, it, it's that's a very, very individual question. So quite difficult to, um, to answer awesome. for you. Please feel free just into email and we can take this outside of this uh, mm. room here. Final question, uh, somebody's doing a half marathon in November to practice race day routine. So it's quite early out, John, yeah. but always good to, to practice. Has, yeah, hasn't he, raced for 10 years. He hasn't raced for 10 years. So that, uh, you want to settle the but, nerves a little bit. But, Anyways, but he's on asked, that point, yeah. I, would, I would take it as a steady race mm -hmm. and not flat out yes. at this stage. Uh, he, he's uh, asking you, Tracy, is uh, what would you suggest is the ideal carb load how many days, how much to take on, et cetera, before the race? Yeah, I think that car carbohydrate loading, and you know, I'm going to touch on this uh, uh, another session, is, is sort of, um, it's not so strict anymore. Um, I think the key thing for you is to make sure that you're in the days leading up to, to the race, as you should be doing now and throughout your training, is make, just making sure that you've got a regular amount of carbohydrate in your meals, because... Um, that helps to top up your um, muscle glycogen levels. And what it will mean is that, you, you know, you're, you're going to be starting the race with a full tank. And it, um, depending on how long it, it's going to take you to do that half, half marathon, it will either um, be enough to get you through or you you might actually have to um, top up with a little um, um, electrolyte drink or, or, or a gel. But for most people at this moment in time, it's quite quite early days. But um, yeah, in the days leading up um, to to the the race, just make sure that your 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 tank is fully stocked all the time, and this means including carbohydrate at uh, each meal. Perfect, brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think I think the fact that it's a half marathon, you know, with all due respect, you know, it's a lot different if it's a marathon. So I think mm -hmm. having your glycogen stores topped up is for two or three days is sufficient, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, Tracy. That's I think that's all the, all the questions. Oh, let me just quickly see. Yeah, that's all the questions for you, Tracy. Just a couple quickly for you, Keith, yeah. um, that we haven't quickly covered. Um, how long should a warm up be before a run? And are there any exercises that um, should follow? Again, we'll cover this in more detail at the, at the training day. But um, I think, you know, a warm up really just wants to be getting the muscles ready for the run so starting with a, a kind of slow you know a walk brisk walk into an easy jog 
so gradually waking up those muscle groups um uh, then you know doing a doing a, a reasonable amount of jogging five, 10 15 minutes if the more intense the training session is going to be the longer the warm up's going to be so if we're if we're more advanced and we're actually going to be doing some real seat speed work then you need a good warm up you need some specific drills um and then you need some strides but if it's warming up for things like threshold or general runs or hills then uh, 10 15 minutes of easy running making sure you've got no tight areas and then just going steadily into the session is, is, is enough is perfect excellent a couple of quick questions about um shoe problems and uh, toes getting blisters and maybe the sizing for trainers and how they should be should be a yeah somebody's getting fitted. blisters on the end of their yeah. toes um i think uh, you know um, generally if you can put a thumb you know that way on at the end of your toes then the shoe should be yeah there should be ample space your sh your feet do expand a bit more so the wider on, gate that some on a lot but on a long run they yeah. do tend some to suggest expand. it is a great idea yeah but the with the blisters i mean it, it might not be that the your toes are at the end of the shoe <clears throat> it might be that they actually slip in forwards because you're not doing the laces up properly it might also be that the socks you're using are not great um we both wear beleaguer socks we've got no allegiance to them but we just find them to be really really good yes, socks um so lacing up properly good socks a reasonable amount at the end of the toe box um and if that doesn't work then you've probably got the wrong size shoes yep absolutely um a couple of questions that i know that moss has gone now but uh so eliza asked if there was a deal for non-injured runners yes that we'll send all uh, moss's details out separately but there's a there's a deal for non-injured uh, runners you can go and see him with a discount you can go online and see him more as an uh, as an, an, an analysis of where yeah. you're at at the moment. Um, but we'll send all that information out. Uh, advice for sports massages: How often to recommend during a training block for getting a sports massage, and how many days before race day? I think if you've got a good sports uh, masseuse, then um, and you can afford it, then to have almost like a, a kind of belt and braces checkup massage every three weeks or once a month is fantastic um if your legs are getting particularly sore then every couple of weeks if they're getting particularly sore then we could do with finding the reason that that's happening so um but some good stretching using your foam roller um and getting a sports massage once a month perfect in terms of before the marathon then i wouldn't have a sports massage any later than the wednesday AM, maybe PM of a Wednesday before the race, because the next couple of days, your legs feel a little bit weird, um, especially if it's a deeper massage. You want to make sure you drink plenty of water after you've had a sports massage to get rid of some of those toxins yeah. that they've released. I'm um, just going to share. So finally, our... that's, that's um, kind of uh, it for today. We've got the live training day in London on the 27th of January. Gracie um, will be there. Moss will, will be, be there. there. We'll be there. We'll be there. Jazz will be there. Um, yeah. The details of that are going to be released very, very shortly. Um, it is uh, limited space. So if you want to get into it, then sign up as soon as possible. The only thing I will ask is if you sign up and you decide that you won't be able to make it, can you please just have the courtesy to let uh, Jazz know or Debbie okay. know so that the somebody else can list, can take the place? Because yeah. we always have a waiting list and um, it's nice if if we're full and nobody misses it. Um, we're gonna we're gonna have a practical training session. Moss will be in his element doing some practical work. Uh, Tracy will be telling you all about um, energy gels and and okay. hydration and everything for the race and race week. Um, and Jazz will be there to to uh you can chat to her about your fundraising um we also have two more zoom sessions um one in february 24th where we're looking at why and how you include a half marathon in your practice race in your training uh, and also progress in the long run and and all things about training at that stage and then march uh, 23rd we've got the uh the final part that's, of the that's puzzle. pretty much four weeks out from, from race yeah. day so we talk very much specifically about race day preparations tracy's yeah top top advice and then also then just talking about how to run 
your best London marathon. So. And, and how not to freak out in the last <laughs> yeah. week. So hopefully it's a, it's a kind of a phased approach to help yeah. you with the training, the support you need at the time when you when you want to be thinking about it. So, you know, yeah, but, let's not worry about race day just yet. But um, just please remember that we are here to help you on this journey. Um, remember when when it gets a bit grey, when it gets a bit wet and when it gets a bit snowy and cold in Canada <laughs> that you're doing this for a fantastic cause you're doing this a lot of people are relying on you and and you're doing it for yourself yeah. and and it it will be a, an amazing day if you can just put in the groundwork and tick those boxes patiently you'll get there and you're going to have a wonderful time so uh, so keep in touch if we can help you if you haven't got a plan please just message uh, me at the email you've got you'll see here yeah um we can get that sorted out for you but we're here like jazz said at the beginning we're, we're here to to uh to help you um ha have the best day possible basically so, um and to help you with your training between now and then you've got a great team so, so thank you tracy thank you thank jazz you, thank, you, uh, and, uh, yes. thank you moss and uh we'll see you next time yes. and uh yeah let's crack on good training everybody <laughs> see you thank you